I hope you're having a great day, and welcome to Coastview, the show that every single day celebrates the men and women who are making coastal Mississippi such a great place to live, work, and play. And today's show is no exception to that. A little bit longer lead-in today because I'm going to share a personal experience with you that ties back to our guests here shortly. I wanted to share a uh, quote, though, to start the show. It actually applies to the show in a lot of ways, but it's a quote by the uh, genius and, and brilliant filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, who once said this, however vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. No, no matter, however vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. I think that's true in, in creating great movies. It's also really true in life that it says a lot about the, the need for us at times to sort of control our, our own destiny and uh, overcome the challenges that we face in life. It may surprise you to learn that I actually struggled reading as a child. Um, I mean, mightily. I mean, I mean, significantly had an issue with reading. And uh, you know, we go on to be a CEO of media companies and publisher of newspapers. So to hear someone admit that he had a difficult time reading, um, it might again, might be a bit of a surprise to the listeners. But I grew up in, in the 1960s when something like dys, dys, dyslexia and other learning disabilities were identified as mostly kind of like learning disabilities. And they might have even said, you know, that's, that's the dumb child, put him over in the corner or whatever. It's sad to say it that way, but it's true. I mean, a lot of children experience that. Uh, you know, there, there was a time when we didn't fully understand these learning disabilities, and certainly what we knew about them were not institutionalized into sort of the education processes of schools. So I didn't have the benefit, and I'm not blaming anyone for that. It's just, it's just it's the time that I grew up. Um, but on top of having sort of those, those you know, that reading challenge that was uh, pretty significant, I was, I, you could say that I was a hyperactive, and certainly I had attention deficit disorder. Um, if I look back and were, were to bring my teachers on this show, they would probably tell you they feared me because I was literally a handful. I think I was, you know, pretty bright guy and kind of knew how to manipulate and whatever, but I, I, but I struggled at school and I was super outgoing. I had one teacher once that actually identified me in a school newsletter as Mr. Fidgets. Now that sa sounds not so bad, but when you're a kid that's having trouble and you know that you're overcoming the trouble at the time I felt to myself god that was a cruel thing to say about me you know I, I don't, and that was actually published in the school newsletter I had a math teacher once in eighth grade he pulled me aside one day I'm going to reveal who he is um, but he told me to go get a good trade that math was not my thing and uh, and I, again, I look back on that and I think, what a careless thing to say to someone! What what a what a hopeless set thing to say to a young person who was struggling to learn. But I thank God that along the way, I actually got encouraged by uh, a few teachers, just a few. But but uh, but they they were very helpful to me, and they made a huge difference in my life. They began to sort of teach me how to learn. And and frankly, to be honest with you, it was those teachers that were the difference between passing and failing school. I, I think about my poor parents, man. God bless them. And they, they didn't really know how to handle me. I, 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 you know, again, I barely made it through school. I was often ridiculed because of that. And it was a, a lot of social uh, 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 interaction that was tough for me as a result of that. But, but I overcame it. I overcame it by being kind of big time outgoing. I overcame came it when I found music, incidentally. Uh, we've talked a lot about music on my show, but music became my outlet. It was the thing that ultimately helped me develop how to learn. It was interesting how that happened for me, but it did. And it would able, I was able to sort of compensate for some of the difficulties I was having through my music. And, you know, most of you know, I played drums and bang on the piano, but I became a pretty good drummer. But eventually I overcame most of my difficulties. I had to learn how to literally rewire my brain, went on to college and did, and did very well. Um, what I've learned these days, though, is that you, uh, you know, that, that we, we've learned a lot. And, and but we learned there's specific things that we have to do to help people along. Um, when a kid is hyperactive like I was, it makes it more challenging, and sometimes it gets misdiagnosed. So it's important. Obviously, today we we learn a lot more about that, and we're going to talk about that in a second. What I again, I felt like I was pretty bright, but my mind was racing all the time. I can remember even as adult rolling weeks 
the former publisher of the, of the Sun Herald used to tell me to slow down. He would, he would tell me to slow down. He said I was moving too fast and I was leaving people in my wake. And I had to learn to, to communicate slowly, to think, to slow down my thought processes. I could go on and on. But, you know, again, our guest today will be able to relate to about everything that I'm talking about here in just a second. Um but I, re, I re, remapped how my brain learns, and I had a lot of success. I just wanted to mention that that when you have dyslexia or a learning disability, it doesn't mean that you are short of in, on intelligence. I mean, if you go back in time and think about people who have had learning disabilities, Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawkins and Leonardo da Vinci and Pablo Picasso, presidents who had learning disabilities, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Thomas Jefferson, John F. Kennedy, Woodrow Wilson. If you look at some of the great entrepreneurs in America today, some of the greatest entrepreneurs, Richard Branson and Charles Schwab and Barbara Corker and, and Damon Ch Ch John and John Chambers, there's a long list of them that have done extraordinarily well as it relates to that. And uh, I wanted to share that story because the more I got focused on it, the more I thought it would be important to talk about it. And there's a, a very important bill that's up before the legislature today that I want to talk about as well. But I want to inv invite into the conversation Laura Lacoste, who's a director at Lighthouse Academy for Dyslexia, and my old friend Tracy Variantes. Our kids went to school together, <laughs> the executive director of Lighthouse Academy for Dyslexia. How are you guys doing? We're great. great. Thanks Doing for good. having us. And let me just say, this is Tracy, who's the executive director of Lighthouse Academy. Um, I, I could never do her job, but I am a parent of a former student, yeah. and I sit on the board at the school. You're on the, you're on the board of directors, right? I'm on the right. board of directors, correct. So, so yeah. Tracy, when I you heard my story and what I shared, you're not – a lot of those dots connect that I just shared, don't they? All of them. Every single one of them. Um, you are the the one that made it to the tip of the iceberg. Like you got to rise up above the frozen water. Um, unfortunately, our prison systems are filled with people that didn't have your positive experiences and probably your um, parental support. And um, and recent studies have shown that about fifty percent of our prison population is dyslexic. And while that may ring in people's ears thinking, oh, well, that's something where people reverse their B's and D's or their P's and their Q's. It's something that has nothing to do with reversing your letters. And to be dyslexic, you must have average to above average intelligence. So when you stop to think about our prison systems are filled with people with average to above average intelligence that are illiterate, um, I think that's a very condemning statement on where we are in education and how as a society, there is a certain population that we have failed because we have not moved with the science, acknowledged who they are, identified them and trained our educators to remediate them. Tracy, let's, get, let's talk a little bit more about <clears throat> what dyslexia is. Well, I was trying to explain to Anne uh, for years, I've told her about this thing. And she said, wow, we all struggle with, with that. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, mm -hmm. I explained to her even today, even today when I read, I read in a very um, 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 precise and, 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 and focused way. I mean, I see every word. It's, an, it's, an, it's, it's hard to explain. And the other thing about the way my brain works, um, and, I've, and people who work with me have heard me say this before, but I've never really framed it within the context of my brain was just wired differently. Mm -hmm. But I saw challenges in the company in pictures. And I, I literally envisioned, I could literally put, like, people would say, why do you have such a good memory? I could have a good memory because I could remember sort of like where, where a conversation took place. And the conversation that I could remember wasn't the conversation itself the words of the conversation, but it was the visions that projected out of the conversation. And I could, if you, if you recall the conversation to me, I could remember the conversation, but I was seeing it in images. It's a, yeah. it's a strange thing. I don't see it in words. I literally see it as a vision. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to share with you, I was diagnosed with dyslexia my freshman year of college at Loyola University. And thank God I was at Loyola because had I been anywhere else, I doubt that I would have gotten that diagnosis. And it was the difference between me being on the president's list and me struggling to, to master a foreign language, which I had avoid, and avoided all through high school and had taken sciences instead. Um, 
So I can totally relate, relate to what you're saying. It's very easy for me to manipulate um, objects in my mind. If I've seen them, I can move them from one place to another. I know exactly what something's going to look like. I understand big concept pictures. It's easy for me to connect um, ideas and concepts and people and understand how those things tie together. My skill sets are very different than um, what I remember them to be in um, elementary education. Hey, let's, we're going to talk about that. When we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with uh, two people who are very passionate about a, a specific learning disability having to do with dyslexia. Uh, Laura Lacoste is on the board of directors for the Lighthouse Academy of Dyslexia, and then Tracy Barrientos, who's the executive director there. We'll continue the conversation on the other side. Welcome back to Coast View. I have Laura Lacoste, who's the director of the board for the Lighthouse Academy of Dyslexia, and my old friend Tracy Barrientos is the executive director there. We're going to come back in just a second to defining dyslexia here in the in the way that we were doing before we went to break. But come, Laura, coming back to you, tell me about your passions for this subject. Um, well, it goes back to when my son was about five or six, and thank goodness we had a preschool teacher who had a dyslexic child of her own, because unfortunately most of our teachers don't know anything about dyslexia, they're getting there. Um, long story short, he was diagnosed. It was a, a great struggle for second and third grade, despite some really good and helpful teachers. We landed in the dyslexia school with Tracy Barrientos, uh, was his sixth grade teacher and life-changing three years at that school. So they're stuck with me ever since he's in ninth grade now, but I'm on the board. They can't get rid of me. I, I adore them, love them and love this mission because I've learned so much and I've seen, I, I'll say the statistics wrong, so I won't say it. But if you look, the number that either end up as entrepreneurials and super successful because they're able to, they have the support and they make it through is almost as big as the percentage and number that do end up in prisons and end up because they're very clever. They're going to make it happen, just not always in a legal, you know, or, or way that society approves of. And so for me, I just jumped on board because I can't imagine something that makes more sense than trying to help these children at a young age and set them on the right path for success where they're, you know, successful contributing members of society in the way that God intended them to be and not someone that's being supported by society in a prison system. So, yeah, th th those are actually yeah. very, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but they're very compelling statistics. That's uh, really unfortunate to hear those statistics. Mm -hmm. Tr Tr Tracy, let's come back to you. Let's finish kind of defining uh, dyslexia and then we'll move we'll move on and talk a little bit about this legislation that's before the legislature as we speak but let's let's define it a little bit better so the definition that the international dyslexia association uses is pretty complex it has to do with um, neuro pathways and that it's neurobiological in origin meaning that um, your brain takes different routes to go through the reading process in layman's terms, it means when you have a really smart person who you would think have all the capacities to pick up reading, writing, and spelling easily, and they can't. Um, our brains were not created for reading. Um, we map that man-made idea on top of other sections of our brain that have evolved through history and science. Um, and we know these things through fMRI imaging and research that's come out of the Connecticut Longitudinal Study, which is about 40 years old, out of Yale. So the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity was one of the leading organizations that did that scientific research um, in neurology. Uh, the founders are Dr. Bennett Shaywitz. He was a, or is, a neurologist and scientist, and his wife, Dr. Sally Shaywitz, who is a developmental pediatrician. And their work continues today. They are really trailblazers. They're very outspoken about our educational processes. And uh, Dr. Sally Shaywitz actually sat on the National Reading Panel back in 2000 with some of the, the scientific data that said, this is what we know about reading and this is how we know to remediate it. And almost 20 years later, we're still having ineffective methods in the classroom. Isn't and that amazing that though that we've learned so much? Because the thing that I'm thinking about the whole time you're talking is what, what about all the people like me in the 60s? If we'd had access to all this stuff, right, yes. what would be different the today? Name, the name to know that something was going on. My mother's dyslexic. She knows that now, but back then she was called lazy 
because they would say, well, you're so smart. There's no reason you can't do this. Mm -hmm. She's very smart, but reading was very, very hard for her. Right. Spelling is it's still hard for her. So national yeah. behavior expert Amy Dean always says children that can will. And, and if they can, they will, right? So as teachers, when we see a really bright kid in the classroom that can't sit still, that can't do what you're asking them to do, we're assuming that it's not that they can't. We're assuming it's that they won't. They won't That's try. They won't put in enough effort. That somehow this is within their ability and their control. And we set <clears> them <throat> up for behavior difficulties, for failure difficulties. They get labeled and, mm -hmm. and they rise to the occasion of the label that's put on them. So. Hey, so, you know, the, the solution to me when I was in third and fourth grade was to make me go across the hall and get paddled. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what... Mm -hmm. That was a solution. And that helped you read, right? <laughs> yeah, it helped me a lot. <laughs> it's a it really gave me really great confidence in some, of, in some of those teachers, that's for sure. Yeah. Right. What were you saying, Lauren? I'm sorry. It's, it's sad messaging because the sad thing is, is these kids really are trying so hard. A good yeah. analogy I heard is like a duck on the water. They look like calm and underneath they're just paddling so hard because they feel stupid and they see their friends doing this easily. So they feel like, oh gosh, what's wrong with me? And all that's kind of in their head and then reinforce when adults say the same sort of things to them. So they need to start to develop behaviors to get out of reading and, and do things to, you know, you'd rather be the class clown than be the class idiot. Yeah. You know, just to put it bluntly. Well, but that, that's exactly that. <laughs> you couldn't be any more clear about who I was, yeah. but look, here's the thing. Um, we know we've learned a lot. There's a lot of, of science and, 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 and teaching techniques that are out there now that can help in very significant ways. That's the kind of work that you guys are doing at Lighthouse, Lighthouse Academy for Dyslexia. There's a bill up in the, in the legislature as we speak that could get adjusted that would take some of the professionalism out of it, if I'm reading this correctly. <clears throat> what, tell me about the bill and what, why it's important to you. Sure. So um, Senate Bill 2333 um, had language inserted in it that came out of House Bill 1200. House Bill 1200 actually passed out of committee with no questions, unanimous, went to the floor of the House of Representatives and did not have one negative vote against it. So it was unanimous passing. And that bill expanded the definition in Mississippi state law of a dyslexia therapist to include and as certified academic language therapist. Now, the way you get that licensure is through an organization called the Academic Language Therapist Association. And they're actually a national organization that has some global influence in English speaking countries. So they have been around since 1986 and they are considered the gold standard when it comes to academic language therapy. So Mississippi back in 2012, um, as they passed a law that said that a dyslexia therapist is only a dyslexic therapist and can get that 203 licensure from the Mississippi Department of Education if they receive a master's degree in dyslexia therapy from a university. And Mississippi has three universities out of the entire country that actually bestows that master's degree. Um, since that time, I think one or two years ago, William Keary also came up with a dyslexia specialist degree. So that's one step closer to your doctorate. However, I am educated at William Keary University, loved that program. I felt like I learned a lot through it. And I have my master's in dyslexia therapy. I am ineligible to sit for that next level that they call a specialist degree. It does not give me anything different than my master's degree. And so I cannot sit for that. So this bill says that you do not have to have, if you continue, you already have a master's degree or a specialist degree, it is unnecessary to go back and receive a second master's or an additional advanced degree to receive this in your licensure. You merely need to go through the CAP training program, which is a two-year program. It requires a master's degree to sit for the national exam at the end of it. It takes a minimum of 700 practicum hours that are overseen by someone who's completed an additional program with CALT to oversee, you're called a qualified instructor, and you have to have 200 classroom instruction hours, specifically in language remediation. 
Tracy, say, let me let me can we say this in in, in yeah. simple terms? I'm going to say this as a parent because here people are qualified to work with dyslexic kids. Yes, at qualified. the end of the day, what we and this you know this happens a lot. This is a mm -hmm. conflicting objectives where one group's trying to stay isolated as the only that can do it, and they want they want that. And we as citizens in the community want more people focused on the problem because if we get more people focused on the problem who are who are certainly capable to focus on the problem, we can help solve the problem. And we got to cast a net wider, and that's what you're attempting to do. It's like yes. we have tons of thirsty people and we're just putting the faucet on a drip when we have access to the water. And almost 100,000 dyslexic kids in the state, and although these dyslexia therapists are awesome, Tracy comes from that program, there's not enough to even touch the tip of the iceberg. Well, in the northern part of our state, the Delta, I mean, yeah. our areas that really struggle to get these specialists in, yeah. um, they don't have access. I mean, a teacher, it's very difficult to, to travel to a university program that's located in Jackson or Hattiesburg and, and do this over the course of two years. Or for a teacher yeah. who feels compelled to work with dyslexic kids to have the amount of time and the money it takes to go get this second master's and to pay for the, the tuition to do that. Right. This opens the door for more people who have a heart to work with these kids, right. you know, yeah. and get them into the public school system. And we realize that this bill does not solve um, issues. I've gotten letters that have said, um, yeah, we, we, we know it doesn't solve all the issues, but it's a step. Well, but I, I think at the end of the day, I spent a lot of time with the Delta, so I get that point as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have to be able to serve everyone in the state. And, and in other words, we have to cast a wider net of professionals that can help us solve the problem. It seems like a no-brainer to me. Hopefully, you can be successful mm -hmm. in getting this thing across. I saw the the uh, petition online, you should, you know, people should go there and check that out. They're interested in this subject, but we'll, we'll, this won't be the last conversation we have about it. It's been a pleasure to, to spend some time with you, Tracy and Laura. Thank you so we much. We encourage people to go sign that petition before the vote today. It has over 2,600 Mississippians that have spoke out. 100%. We'll see you right after this break. Thank you.